We're nearly there. Right. Unbelievably. Did I speak too soon? No, I didn't. Okay, this, that's all wrong then. So the screen is all a bit weird, but I'll sort that out, don't worry. Do we need to shut the blinds? You should be alright. Today, this lecture, this week, is about... Well, when I wrote it, it was about hybridity, identity and identification. And it still is, but the emphasis is um, less on... When you say words like hybridity, then the theorist that you might think of would be homey bar bar, right? But I set two pieces of reading. One was... Um, oh, I'll get to that. Cultural hybridity... Can you read the blue? I need to... I'll break down one of these things. Tell me about it's the blue we've That's, that's a bit better. Whatever. You can look at it later on at your leisure. Um, so this lecture is about cultural hybridity, but not in the way that it's theorised by Homi Baba. And it is about identity in a kind of globalised, post-colonial world. And the, not the theoretical notion of identification um, is very, very important. It's really... Um, in one sense, it's about the, the idea, the importance, and the possibilities of cross-ethnic or cross-cultural identification, right? And we're going to look at it by way of um, this lecture. Really, will focus on an article by Bill Brown, written in 1997, called "Global Bodies, Post-Nationalities: Charles Johnson's Consumer Culture," and it's. I've read it loads of times, and I'm not going to lie to you, it's very, very difficult, dense, theoretically complex in a way that you don't often get, um, and it's about a, a short story by Charles Johnson, um, about some, uh, a guy, uh, an African-American, in 1973, 1974, who falls in love with Kung Fu, and it changes his life, right? So that sounds simple enough. It sounds simple enough. But really, the, 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 the article, the essay and the, art, the, the short story and, the, and, and Bill Brown's article, are kind of, they're kind of inspired by the question, like, what happened when the Kung Fu craze of the 1970s happened? So in the 1970s, Kung Fu really, really exploded onto the screens, into people's lives. It became the new thing, right, that, that people all over the Western world all of a sudden wanted to do. North America, Europe, Australia, India, Africa, everywhere. So it's about, it's about the essays about what the bloody hell was going on there? What was going on? And was there anything important going on? Because on the one hand, obviously, it's really trivial. It's just sort of a Kung Fu craze, it's no, no big deal. But on the other hand, what was going on in culture when that this could happen? That North Americans could be falling in love with Chinese culture? What does that mean? So this is the start of the... These two paragraphs are from the start of the, um, the article, not the story. Fed up with her husband's absorption in the Kung Fu culture of Seattle, Evelyn Johnson, Evelyn Johnson finally explodes, You can't be Chinese. She can't imagine Rudolph's longing for a new body, for a new self, as anything but his longing for a new ethno-nationality. I think it's strange, Rudolph, why didn't you grow up in China? No, I'm sorry. I think it's strange, Rudolph, you didn't grow up in China, she said. They can't breathe in China. They all ride bicycles, for Christ's sake. They want what we have. Exasperated by his wife's failure to understand his new preoccupation, Rudolph patiently explains that he doesn't want to be Chinese. I only want to be what I can be. 
What Evelyn experiences as his violation of the cultural codes by which a black couple endures the oppression of middle age, uh, middle class middle age as his debasement of familiar modes of identity formation, Rudolf scripts as a purely personal project of self-salvaging, and he does so echoing the US Army's famous slogan of the early 1980s, Be All You Can Be, a slogan meant to recode the post-Vietnam military as the site of post-patriotic self-realisation. So you see, straight away, that it's quite, there's quite a lot packed into these sentences, the way in which he's reading the story of, of, of the, his wife, of Evelyn, Rudolph's wife. She's reading his interest in Chinese cultural practices in Kung Fu as his desire for a new ethno-nationality, a new ethnicity. Um, and she's living a life by certain cultural codes. You know, what is it to be a middle-aged black American? How do you live your life? Cultural codes, because we all live our life through cultural codes. And he's articulating his desire in the language given to him through the media, through adverts for the army, be all you can be. We get them now, we see them, be the best army soldier. It's not selling it to me. But, um, you know, these sort of, sort of mediated messages that then are interpreted and reused by Rudolf as... as a personal statement, I only want to be the best that I can be, but that message is coming from American adverts for the American military. So there's a connection between the military, masculinity, life, the, the ways in which we live our life, and then ethnicity straight away in this, in this essay. So you might not be able to read that because it's um, quite blue, literally blue. To the degree that Rudolph's new body because he, so he, he goes off and he starts, he's a middle-aged man, he's fat, he's got flat feet, he's unfit, he didn't join the army because he, was, he, was, he failed the, the exam, the, the physical exam, and he works for the post office. <clears throat> and then he sees a kung fu film, and then it changes his life, <clears throat> and he gets a new body and a new self-respect and all the rest of it. To the degree that Rudolph's new body is predicated on a globalising media distribution network, films, Watching Chinese or watching Hong Kong films in North America, so his new body is predicated on a globalizing media distribution network. The story anticipates the moment of globalization when, as Ian Ang has put it, every identity must define and position itself in relation to the cultural frames affirmed by the world system. At the same time, the story describes a process of self realization released from the physical metaphysical binary. It posits an ontological alternative to what Eldred Cleaver long ago called the Western gulf between mind and body, that structures the gulf between two races. So there's a lot going on there, and I'm not going to explain that. I'm not going to offer an explanation. I'm just, uh, what I want you to do is when you read this article, just power through the bits that you don't necessarily get, and get the bits that you do get, and it will be worth your while, I think, if you want to write an essay about identity and globalisation and so on. It doesn't matter if you don't know what ontological means, it doesn't matter if you don't know about the binding between physical and metaphysical, just read on. It is, it is as though the story, the story itself, longs to teach us the obsolescence of both the nation and the body. The lesson begins not with philosophy, but with a question about everyday life. How does the transnational flow of goods and services extend the consuming subject's affiliative horizon? And how does it thus revise or leave unrevised existing accounts of ethnic, national and mass subjectivity? And that's the bit that interests me, this, la this last bit, this question. How does the transnational flow of goods and services, globalised film in this case, Extend the consuming subject's affiliative horizon, the way a person sees themselves, and thinks of themselves. Because we often think of ourselves in regional, linguistic, religious, cultural, whatever, t local, let's say local terms. We think of ourselves in local terms, but then you see something from the other side of the world, and that can transform the way that you think about yourself and who you are, what you're about, what you identify with. And how does it change the way we think about ethnic, national, and mass subjectivity? So when we say we, I guess we mean 
academics, books with theorists, and so on. So here's the story. I will read it out to you. Rudolf Jackson is a 54-year-old national employee, a post office worker with high blood pressure, emphysema, flat feet, skinny legs, a big belly, and a pecker that shrinks to no bigger than a pencil eraser each time he sees his wife undress. So he's not living the most glamorous life. But it's a familiar kind of narrative, you know, it's like middle-aged, you know, your desires have gone, nothing's exciting or sexy anymore, you go, I'm crap, my body's crap, everything's crap, I'm just going to decline and die, that's what's going to happen to me. Out with his wife one Saturday night to see a peaceful, peaceful movie, his eyelids droop during the feature, but he's enthralled by a trailer for a kung fu film, which Evelyn thinks of as a poor excuse for Chinese actors or Japanese, she couldn't tell these people apart, to flail the air with their hands and feet, take on 50 costumed extras at once, and leap 20 feet through the air in perfect defiance of gravity. So she doesn't like it. It's just Chinese, Japanese, whatever. It's just, it's just silly. Silly. Rudolph, rather than joining her the next day at the revival meeting at their Baptist church, returns alone to watch the movie at the Commodore Theatre. Even more enthralled by the beauty of the martial art, he joins a queen, which is just a club, um, sends for $800 worth of equipment, starts to meditate, begins an extraordinary physical regime that prompts his complete physical and psychic rejuvenation, and finally performs his success after eight months by competing in a Kung Fu tournament held in Seattle's King Dome. So, cheesy, but interesting. This is the trailer for the film he went to see. This was, I pause that maybe, this was, this was a film that had lots of titles. It's most commonly known as Five Fingers of Death. And it was the first Hong Kong martial arts film that went, bam, big style in, um, in the West. And it was a, a deliberate product of the Hong Kong film industry in the 60s and 70s to break the, uh, the Western market, the American market. They wanted, they made a lot of these films that were never shown in Hong Kong or in Asia. And they were just going, get these into America at some point, we're going to make mega bucks here. And this was the one, 1973, start of 1973, the film that made the mega bucks. Five Fingers of Death, first real kung fu film that Western people have seen. So, oh, recognize that the astonishing ritual of the fires. Pale before the forbidden ritual of the steel palm. So it's pretty cool. I think.
think you'll agree. So this is, you know, you've got to try and imagine having never seen fight choreography like this. Like, it's just the most... If you try to imagine not having seen good fight choreography, and you've seen John Wayne and, and cowboy films where they, like, smash balsa wood chairs over each other and go, oh, oh, and maybe throw someone along the bar, and that's the best thing you're going to get. This is quite... This is a paradigm shift. This is, this is a radical transformation. And this was the one that really softened up the film companies in North America and distribution um, networks and so on to be hospitable to the possibility of um, s making their own film, making a Western film, um, starring a non-white or not Sidney Poitier, but a, a non-white lead actor, and that was Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee starred in the first um, American-produced... Oh, no, no, no. All oh, right, we'll watch this. And Lee, the deadly bridge. Penetrate the secret chambers of an evil island empire. But you know how high. It is like a king on that island. Totally self-sufficient. A fortress without walls. Protected by an invincible army that needs no ordinary weapons. This is Enter the Dragon, the first martial arts film produced by a major Hollywood studio. John Saxon is Roper. He was in it for the money. U.S. karate champion Jim Kelly as Wiggins. He was there because he had no choice. Black Belt Hall of Fame undisputed martial arts champion and international film star Bruce Lee. His job was to get them out alive. I'm hoping you'll join us. Represent us. In the United States. You want me to join this? Wilbur, Williams, and Lee. Just when they think they've broken the secret of the island, they find there is no escape from the inscrutable arm. Warner Brothers presents Enter the Dragon, where the world's greatest martial arts athletes meet the ultimate challenge with the most patient. And deadly of weapons. Oh, the most ancient and deadly we've got that again, that's the exact same night. So so um it really was Enter the Dragon that most people saw. So this story is about seeing five fingers of death. Um but Enter the Dragon, which came out the same year, because there was a backstory, there was a lot going on in the industry, you know, that people had noticed. Um, the popularity and success of, of these Kung Fu films all over Asia. So the first one then, Enter the Dragon, the first American produced martial arts film, is still Orientalist, very, very Orientalist. You know, you've got the inscrutable Han, right? You know, the, the, the dangerous Fu Manchu-like kind of um, Chinese body. And it's, so it's Asia-phobic in a way that a lot of Western films... Um, were and continue to be actually, but it's also Asia filia. It's kind of like it's, it's showing how wonderful and, and exotic and desirable and, and brilliant um, Chinese culture can be. So that I mean that's the classic structure of Orientalism anyway. Says Edward Said, you know, the splitting of the other into there's the fearful, bad, evil. So that's Han, evil Han, the inscrutable Han, and then the good, brilliant, you know, superlative which is, of course, Bruce Lee. But, um, interestingly, in, in this film, that Hollywood still wasn't prepared to put all its eggs in one basket, and so they've given Bruce Lee a starring role, but you notice from the trailer that they've set it up to say three ways. They've said, there's Bruce Lee, yeah, but first, we've got uh, the white guy, Roper, or whatever he's called, John Saxon, the white guy, who's a bit like James Bond, right? And then, you've got um, Williams, so that's Jim Kelly, black US karate champion, which registers the fact that the, the film producers know that one of the biggest audiences will be the black market, the, the black audience, not the black market, the black audience. So they've got, they've got the, the Chinese lead, the Asian lead, because that's, that's, what, that's what they want, and Bruce Lee was brilliant at that, okay, Bruce Lee's brilliant. They've got the black guy, because they know that the black audience is into this style of film. 
But they have to have the white actor as well because they're a bit scared about what about if we alienate the white viewers. They didn't know whether whether um, whether white viewers would accept an Asian male lead in 1973. Um, but there was, I think, the, the point about this is the way in which this splitting, however kind of bad it is, also indicates the the fact that there's a possibility for at least for strong cross cross ethnic identification, an identification with Bruce Lee, if you're white or if you're black. So this identification with that person, which is quite a new thing for say white people to be able to identify with the Asian character, especially in North America, in the context of the immediate history of the Vietnam War, when the Asian, the Viet Cong, is the ultimate enemy, the bad guy. So you've got this new thing happening, and also the acknowledgement of the, the strong kind of um, black interest Right? And then you immediately, in the, in the wake of this, you get what started to be called the black exploitation films. You get Black Belt Jones, which stars Jim Kelly. Again. And this, this is worth watching. This. Enter. Mm. Dragon Kelly. He covers the mark as Black Belt Jones. This is not quite as good as Enter the Dragon. Oh, Greg, I'm just saying that. Now, I'm asking you as a favor. You're asking me to be a fool. Get a cup of tax and blast it down. Forget it, man. I ain't going there. It's a fortress. Oh, farmers don't know. It's top priority. So am I. It's suicide. Get out, 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 get I ain't your mama. Now, it's, the, it's, quite interesting. it's quite interesting if you follow these, these three trailers that we've just watched, anyway, this is just something I thought of now. You can see the way that they, I mean, there's a strong intertextuality across them. You know, this one is parasitical on the Bruce Lee, the end of the dragon. It's enter! You know, same font. Same words, same structure. So the, the film itself is a modification of the, the Hong Kong style. It's translated into um, the terms that American um, culture would be hospitable to. And also reflects something that may have been going on in American culture at the time. So the massive takeoff of Chinese and Japanese martial arts by black Americans, black and Hispanic Americans... Um, so this is the thing, this is the real, this is one of the really important questions that Bill Brown's essay gets at. Why was there such a massive ethnic take-up of the Chinese and Japanese martial arts in the wake of these films? So this all really kicked off in 1973. Why did that happen? What does it mean? So back to um, Rudolf um, Jackson, yeah? Back to our fictional story. The guy who gets really energised and really uh, into his, his martial arts as a consequence of seeing a martial arts film. His access point to masculinity, what is it to be a man? To be all you can be, what is it? His access point to thinking about this is provided not by the US military system, he was never in the army, because he was flat-footed and all the rest of it, high blood pressure, but Hong Kong's film industry. So you can see the way in which we think of ourselves when we construct our identities and therefore our practices and values in terms of external objects. External objects might be an advert. You might see an advert and go, that's me. Or you might see someone something else. Or you might experience something that you have military, for example. But Rudolf Jackson doesn't. He experiences masculinity by way of the commodity of a Hong Kong martial arts film. So says Bill Brown. I want to locate China, the story is called China, at the intersection of three theoretical axes. Commodity culture, it's all about commodity culture. Mass masculinity, you know, our, our identities, even as an individual and as personal as they feel, are constructed by way of 
other external things, whether that be commodities or messages or discourses or, or institutions. Mass masculinity. <coughs> so the implication here is that the, the Kung Fu craze changed or modified slightly ideas of masculinity and practices of masculinity. Also perhaps like femininity, if we look back to the, to the black exploitation trailer where you start to see the, the kind of Kung Fu um, or karate expert woman. You know, this is the kind of, there's a transformation there. Um, and spectatorship. So we all go and see the films. We all watch the films. Are we passive? Hmm. And alongside three different and differently narrated histories of world literature. So he's writing about the story as a piece of literature. Of the global reception of Kung Fu films and of the war in Vietnam. One question toward which I'm writing asks how the political resistance of the 1960s, you remember 1968 and all that? Protests, civil rights, yay, down with this sort of thing, freedom. Political resistance of the 1960s transforms into the consumer pleasure of the 70s and 80s. So political resistance transforming into consumer culture. And further, how collective radicality becomes transcoded into a privatising politics of consumption. So, collective radicality being transcoded, transcoded, being transformed, being changed from one thing into another thing, and it's being transformed into a privatising politics of consumption. So not about a group demanding some kind of change, but about a person going, my relation to this practice or this thing or the world is private, this is about me. This, I do my martial arts practice for me. I do my yoga practice for me. I write my poetry for me. Whatever it is, you know. Um, such a question is just the corollary of an attempt to imagine a global poetics that produces literature as a site where the conditions of post-national possibility the structural costs of what we might call outward mobility are inscribed within the everyday. So the idea of the idea of post-nationality, thinking outside of ethnicity, beyond ethnicity, outside of the nation, beyond the nation, is, inscri is inscribed within the everyday. So written into our lives. You know, if, if our if if life is a kind of reading and interpretation and ongoing relationship with objects, then when new objects come along. Kung Fu films from Hong Kong, for example, then they can be, they're written into us, they're written onto us, not like, not as tattoos or whatever, but they're written into our values and the way we think and the way we act. So, culture is produced through its objects, you know, and our relationships to objects. So, Bill Brown explains the worlding of the world, the, the, the coming into existence of the world, this is sort of a philosophical term, as a capitalist effect, the effect, that is, of production and distribution networks that facilitate what Arjun Apadura described as the transnational flow of culture. This is a new thing. Transnational flows of culture haven't always been there. Culture has been national, regional, local. We're dealing here with something transnational, a new thing. Mass circulated icons proliferate beyond the images of white and black Americans where inter-ethnic and international affiliations have the potential to disrupt the rigidity of the national black-white divide. So Bill Brown is suggesting that what we see here is a kind of... If American politics, if American culture was divided, and still is divided a bit, along black and white, along racial lines, this new type of object comes along, which we could call yellow, for the sake of sticking with the colour kind of imagery. And it disrupts that, it transforms it, because now both black and white have a new relationship to a new mediating object or practice called Asian martial arts, which changes things, which changes the relationship, because the, then it, it, just, it, it disrupts the normal cultural processes and flows, because even if, even if martial arts became, in America, strongly black, they also became Hispanic, but also white people wanted it as well. 
So it was potentially a new way of kind of bonding, a new way of reconfiguring social relationships, inter-ethnic, cross-ethnic relationships. If beforehand, if we simplify in the extreme and say, before you've got the black people doing one thing and the white people doing another thing, the black people at one end of the bus and the white people at another end of the bus, when they both want to do the yellow thing, then they're both going to the same clubs maybe, perhaps? They're both interacting maybe? It's changing the relationship, changing the cultural dynamics. So, if ethnic signifiers within the symbolic economy are a means of renegotiating identity, so renegotiating the status of black identity, of Asian identity, then Kung Fu can be said to participate in an internationalizing exchange system of cultural signifiers where additional modes of negotiation might be catalyzed. So Kung Fu was a new thing which changed. It didn't just get inserted into a culture, into North America, into Europe, into wherever. Um, and it didn't change anything. That very insertion changes the whole thing. The same way that as I once discovered when I was making some fantastic meal, an amazing meal, and I was experimenting with adding different flavours to it. And it was, oh, okay, and I added brown sauce. Just a little splash of brown sauce. And it changed everything. And the meal was just now really a brown sauce meal. Because brown sauce really, really... Rude. Don't never cook with brown. I mean, add it by all means, but please don't add it when you're cooking. It screws your meal up. So, but it, it changed everything. And I still remember, this was a long time ago. Oh, I've got to eat this. I can't even add some brown sauce. It's already... I didn't even have any red sauce to try and neutralise. Quickly put some red sauce in to neutralise the brown sauce. Um, <clears throat> So the argument here, yeah, you can read this with Yeah, it quickly, it works, it works. It works on stains as well. If you get a brown sauce stain or something, quickly put some red sauce on. And if that doesn't work, put some salt and pepper on. Um. <coughs> yeah, you'll be all right. If you like tie-dye, it'd be quite nice. Um, anyway, so here's a really important point. Subjectivity itself is no longer thinkable or livable unmediated by a public sphere of consumption. We're made through consumption, perhaps more than we are made through nationalistic kind of ideology before. And I mean, nationalistic ideology still exists. So where are we now? We're quarter past ten. Uh, you see, we, you know, five fingers of death? You see, you see what I've done here? We've got, we've got five fingers of facts. <laughs> five fingers of fun and theory. Okay. So this is about the history of, of the kind of the political economy, the, 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 the production and distribution networks of, of films. Because films don't just happen, you know, you don't just see them, they don't just materialise, they don't just, they don't, they're not just there on iTunes. Oh, I'll just watch that. iTunes hasn't got the world of film, you know, you can't just get films. It's based still on circulation rights and so on. The Shaw Brothers had been making action films originally sword films, since they emigrated from China to Hong Kong in the late 40s, when a lot of people left China to go to Hong Kong or Taiwan because of the, um, the rise of, the, uh, of communism, the communist state in Hong Kong. Um, but actually in all of the recent films about this, it's, people don't leave China uh, because of communism, they leave China because of the Japanese. The, the, the new kind of ideology in Hong Kong and Chinese films. You don't mention communism. You don't mention people being scared of communism. You don't mention Ip Man leaving, leaving mainland China to go to Hong Kong because he didn't want to be in a communist country. He left because he was really hard. He was fighting the Japanese. Um, since the late 40s, they exported a few Kung Fu films to London to Chinatown in 1970. Three years later, Variety could speak of a veritable inundation of Chinese actioners in the global market. The audience attraction to Kung Fu films was so torrid from Lebanon to South America and from Malaysia to Italy that within the year, European distribution rights for any Chinese film rose from $5,000 to $250,000, which in the olden days was a lot of money. Um, in Iran... The success of the Shaw Productions threatened the national film industry. Elsewhere, there were soon plans for Sino-Anglo, Sino-Italian, Sino-German and Sino-American co-productions. 
Charles Johnson set China, the story, in the decade after this inundation, but when Rudolph sees the five fingers of death, he sees the Shaw produced film that established the US market for Kung Fu, the first Kung Fu film to open dubbed outside the US, um, outside US Chinatowns, distributed by Warner Brothers, which soon negotiated with Raymond Chow's Golden Horse production to co-produce Enter the Dragon. So that's the kind of backstory, that's what's going on behind the scenes. And Fist, so Bruce Lee had already made his Hong Kong martial arts films. He made, um, he'd made uh, The Big Boss, and he'd made Fist of Fury, um, and he'd made um, one in Italy called um, Way of the Dragon. One, the Fist of Fury was the good one. Once Fist of Fury entered the world market, Lee finally emerged as the Oriental on the world screens who would finally graduate from the stereotypes of the insidious, vicious Fu Manchu, the obese, inscrutable Charlie Chan, and the mob of unidentifiable farmers and railroad workers. So Bruce Lee obviously transformed the image of Asian men, not in the West, but all over the world. These were the stereotypes that had existed beforehand. Fu Manchu, Charlie Chan, faceless, nameless, sexless, workers who build the railroads in, in, in America. Lee's status as an international superstar was and remains legendary, and that stardom has been especially pronounced in the Middle East, Africa, and South America, and in the third world of the United States, the Black Ghetto, where it has attained a mythic relationship to the ghetto viewer. It's quite interesting, the more you actually read into, the, into Bruce Lee, that in the sort of in the West, in let's call it, you know the white West, Europe, North America, Bruce Lee, ah, 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 how amusing, Kung Fu, Chop Suey, Ah So, right? But in the Third World, or in if your ethnicity is not white, right? Not white, not Anglo-European. Bruce Lee had a much more important status because he was one of the very few non-white faces on screen who was doing something amazing. He was kicking ass, as they say, I believe, in America, that's the official term. Kicking ass, right? White people, black people, Japanese people in particular. Bruce Lee's kicking the living poo out of them. So Bruce Lee becomes a symbol of, of the non-white, of non-white agency, you know, ethnic kind of agency. So this is why people of all ethnicities... Um, just love Bruce Lee. Um, I was um, I was once in a in a bar in New York, in New York City, and um, I was talking to a, a professor, a college professor, as they call him in America, um, and uh, we were talking about Bruce Lee, and I, well, I was talking about Bruce Lee, and uh, they were. Um, and, and the guy, the, so the clever professor with all his qualifications was going, what? And he was Chinese, actually. Going, what, what, why would anyone care about Bruce Lee? What's this? And the guy behind the bar, this old black guy, and his accent suggests he's from somewhere down south in America, he knew instantly what was important about Bruce Lee. And he was going, man, I don't know if we haven't just, have we established whether it's right to try and do someone else's accent? You think it is. Done in the right spirit. Right, well, I'm not, I'll not do his accent. Because <laughs> I don't know what the right spirit is. <laughs> he, was, he just said, Bruce Lee was a hero. He was amazing. He was absolutely amazing. The blacks, the, all of the, you know, the Hispanics, loved him, got him. He was, he was like, he was their hero. A cultural hero. So, Bill Brown is interested in this. And here are a few theories about why the Kung Fu craze happened. In his effort to account for the U.S. Hong, uh, Kung Fu craze, uh, Ying Jen Chang points to both the countercultural investment in Taoism and Buddhism, and to the Chinese American economic interest in developing Kung Fu's popularity. Some industry figures suggested that the well-designed trailers for the films were largely responsible. Raymond Chow himself pointed to Nixon's visit to China in 1972 and the subsequent U.S. interest in Chinese culture. So the question is, why were they so amazingly popular? You know, if you look at them now, you kind of, oh, that's a bit crap, actually, those films. Why were they so amazingly popular? And here are a list of theories. Maybe because at this time, 
late 60s, early 70s, countercultural ideology and the interest in difference, cultural difference, different religions, different worldviews, everyone fed up with Christianity, westernisation. Maybe it's because everyone was interested in all things um, Asian anyway. America occupied Japan after the Second World War, fell in love with it. Uh, you know, they, they went, wow, this is amazing, I really love the calligraphy, and, uh, and I love the, the Buddhism, it's brilliant, better than Christianity, it's a lot more fun. Maybe it was this, Nixon went to China in 1972, maybe it was just this general kind of, ooh, what's going on in China? Still, whatever the reason, says Bill Brown, it is less the ethnic specificity of Bruce Lee than what we might call his generic ethnicity that seems to have inspired the enthusiasm of the US black inner city audience. This generic ethnicity, along with an implicit invitation to translate the ethno-nationalist conflict staged within the Kung Fu film into the conflict of class. So, Bruce Lee's films, most Hong, many Hong Kong martial arts films, but especially Bruce Lee's Hong Kong films, were about class. So basically, you've got an ethnic group, Chinese workers normally, who are being exploited and, some, and killed by baddies. Um, so that might be an evil Thai drug lord, or it might be the Japanese in Shanghai, right? Uh, turn of the 19th century. Beaten down on these poor, suppressed, oppressed Chinese. And Bruce Lee just goes right and just kicks everyone's heads in and then kills the body and then gets killed himself. And so he's a tragic, amazing symbol of, of, of standing up for the oppressed. So there's an energy there, there's a kind of class energy. Working class people go, yes! Kill the oppressors, beat them up, hooray! Also, he's just not white. He's just not white, which matters. I've said that quite a few times. Generic ethnicity. So that he can stand, for he's a symbol of ethnicity and cultural difference and he's a symbol of the oppressed rising up. Indeed, if we're to believe the account of this international mass spectatorship, we might, imagined, we might imagine a failed moment of international class longing. So maybe this is the kind of, you know, he's, he's, the popularity of Bruce Lee and the popularity of Kung Fu represents this desire for justice, class justice, ethnic justice. So, While commentators grow up to a rationale to explain the particular attraction of Kung Fu for black audiences, the industry's report on the primary audience for the 21 Kung Fu films that appeared in the United States in 1973 made it clear to producers that a new market had emerged. Not unpredictably, Black Belt Jones, which we saw a bit of the trailer of, in which black martial arts students battle white gangsters, became the first US lensed, look, you know, looking through and looking at the US, martial arts, action film. Even though the overall market diminished by the end of the year, Kung Fu films continued their success in urban centres. So this is an important point. Commentators, intellectuals, academics, journalists, are going, oh, what's going on here? Why is this so popular? But people who made films didn't, give a, didn't care about that. They were like, ah, black people are watching these. Right, let's make some for, for the black audience. They don't care why, they just respond to the demand. So, this is an important point. While invisibility had come to be understood by some as the provocation of the city riots in America in the 1960s, in the early 1970s the black population had become visible to the film industry as a potent consumer constituency. So the black community in America in the 60s were invisible, politically invisible, they desired political representation. They desired a kind of prominence and presence that they didn't have at all. And yet, they were starting to be looked at, starting to be noticed by the film industry, and starting to find a place in popular culture. And here we bring in Vietnam. The connection between a post-Vietnam moment and the moment of the Kung Fu craze surfaced rarely in 1973, but tellingly. David Freeman explained the craze bluntly. They beat us over there, in Vietnam, and we demand to know why. Our POWs are home now, and America needs to know the enemy's secret weapon. So, just remember at the start of the lecture, and, and Evelyn conflates Chinese and Japanese. Chinese and Japanese don't know, that, well, they're all the same. 
That conflation easily extends to Vietnamese, easily, because it's, it's, you're dealing Asian, 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 who, they're just, it's just Asian, Asian, Asian. So Bruce Lee, as ethnically Chinese as he was, can still easily be a symbol for the Asian enemy of the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong, the baddies. While Kung Fu per se was certainly no secret weapon during the war, Lee's guerrilla tactics in his films replicate what was taken to be the strategy by which US forces were defeated, which might best be understood not as knowledge about why we lost, but as knowledge about how they won, sneaking about, subverting, striking at the vulnerable points, etc., etc. The conservative commentary on the martial arts, long after 1973, still considered their popularity an expression of global conflict. One satirical reporter claimed of the All-American Open Karate Competition that half the contestants and more than half the audience are black or Hispanic. Karate is third world anger release. Anyone can guess the unspoken implication that those little wiry yellow folk are superior. So that was a quote. It would be wrong to perceive in this anything less than anxieties about a new yellow peril exacerbated by the image of an inter-ethnic bond. So there's the last sentence is where the punch is. There was a, a you know, for the conservative establishment in America, such as Bill Brown quotes quite a few cases of them, they're worried, you know, there's a worry about the rise of the East, the rise of China, of Japan. There's a worry about the yellow peril. Remember the yellow peril? Fu Manchu, we're worried about the Chinese and so on. But this worry about the yellow peril becomes exacerbated by the inter-ethnic bond that's taking place in the streets of America. Not only is everything Chinese, Asian, Vietnamese, North Korean, etc. worrying, but also the blacks and Hispanics are really getting into it too. Ah, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So there's this big worry about, it's almost like a kind of, not so much an enemy within, but there's a sort of subversive potential of inter-ethnic identification. So, and this is where we get, Bill Brown gets, Bill Brown gets, is complicated all the way through. I also want to understand the attraction to Kung Fu films as taking the place of, as displacing any sustained attraction to the radical post-nationalizing imagination. So... If there is like radical politics in which you might go, hey, we're all equal no matter what our nationality, no matter what our religion, no matter what, it's, it's a class-based thing, and there's been a strong strand in radical political theory which says, you know, if you start thinking in nationalistic terms, you're really making a terrible mistake because people are people, and there are the oppressors and the oppressed. So workers of the world unite. You know, this is, this is toward the end of the... Towards the end of the start, I can't remember where it is, of the Communist Manifesto, you know, workers of the world, not workers of North America or workers of Britain or workers of Germany united. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains, you have a world to gain, right? That's the radical thought. That's the post national thought, post nationalizing thought. And so there's this post national, there's this kind of cross cultural, inter ethnic identification taking place here. But at the same time as that, it's standing in for and replacing and squeezing politics out of the way. It's almost like there's this energy, if there is an, this kind of energy, this class, antagonistic energy, working class attraction to martial arts. And I believe sociologically, you know, statistically, it was a very, very working class thing when it took off in the 70s in the West. This takes the place of, of any actual radical politics. Stands in for politics. You know, my life's shit, I'm downtrodden, I've got no money, no job, it's rubbish, the police keep hassling me in the street because I'm black. No, no, no. I think I'd go and learn Kung Fu. That's not a political solution, that's a kind of, that's a displacement. So this is, so Bill Brown is suggesting, it's doing some ideological work. You know, it's, the ideological work is, it's a coping mechanism. It's, it's going, oh my God, my life's shit, what can I do? I haven't got anything, I've got my fists, right? The post-national political affiliation imagined by Newton 
reappears instead as the affiliation between Hong Kong and Hollywood, effectively subsidised by the longing of the urban masses. So, you think, okay, there may be something radical or cultural going on here, in cross-ethnic identification, but behind the scenes, really it's business deals. Business deals, partnerships between Hollywood and Hong Kong. So there might be something apparently radical going on culturally, but what you're seeing is business deals. Innovative business deals, which are themselves the start of transnationalism in film, the transnational global film industry. You know, US companies going, well, can we work with you in Hong Kong? That's quite a new thing. And they're exploiting these, the desires and fantasies of, of, of the masses for justice, or to be a hero. The Kung Fu craze does seem to explicable, blah, 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 explicable, blah, 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 explicable, within the cultural logic of urban history as explained by David Harvey, <clears throat> intensifying his sense of 1973 as the pivotal year in the transition to what he calls post-modernity. So a long time ago, David Harvey... Uh, who, who wrote books about postmodernism and postmodernity? Said that 1973 was the year when this happened. This is when the world becomes postmodern, or North America certainly does. Maybe Hong Kong does. Japan starts to be. You know, this 1973 was the year when it all kicked off. The urban spectacle of mass opposition that violently disorganised the space of American cities in the 1960s was finally transformed into the organised spectacle of consumption in reactive urban renovations that produce such new spaces, images and icons as Baltimore's Harbour Place. Now, I, 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 I hope to look that up and find out what that was. I ain't never been to no Baltimore, and I don't know what its Harbour Place is like. But from what I've heard about Baltimore, I'm sure it's, it's delightful. The countercultural scene resurfaces as the commodification of subculture a celebration and commodification of the multicultural fact of the city. So, energies, political energies perhaps, subversive energies being transformed into consumerism. So, if the reception of Lee's film seems to displace an overtly political an explicitly post-national post affiliation with inter-ethnic identification. I think this kind of sentence is not, it's not easy to, to work through, is it? You, you have to kind of go, what, what, what on earth might that mean? Lee's films, these films, these fantasies, these action fantasies, displace, an exp like, displace any real political post-national affiliation. The kind of things that Marxists have wanted for, yeah, they want the workers of the world to unite, and we still have an inter-ethnic identification, <coughs> then Johnson's story, while metonymically recording that reception, metony and metonym is the part that stands in for something larger, and like a symbol, it represents the larger thing, metonym, um, with the way in which a, a fat sign stands for a person. Um, Exhibits a double displacement. Violence has been evacuated from the martial arts aesthetic. And characteristic of the growing appreciation of Kung Fu in the 1980s, a class-coded mode of revenge, harking back to the Boxer Rebellion in China, has been transcoded into a search for self. By 1980, one could learn in the pages of the Atlantic Monthly that the real value lies in what the martial arts tells us about ourselves, what we can be much, uh, that we can be much more than we are now. Existentialist struggle replaces both class and ethnic conflict in a classic case of the embourgeoisement of mass cultural and cross-cultural novelty. Now that is a dense paragraph. But basically it's saying, think about, so you've got your, you've got your black and Hispanic and working class um, audience watching in these poor ghetto cinemas the cheap films that are being imported and shown in the in the, the cinemas without much money and they're seeing class conflict they're seeing the Chinese underdog standing up against the oppressor the rich man the, the, the evil the evil capitalist right 
and they're identifying with it and getting into it and getting really animated by it because they can sort of identify with that. They've been exploited. They want to stand up and fight. Literally. You know, when you say stand up and fight in the political context, you mean it metaphorically, don't you? You mean, we're going to stand up and f you're not going to fight. You're going to do things. You're going to protest. You might have a sit in an occupation. You might have a petition. You might lobby. You, might you don't fight because that's fighting. You'll get arrested. It's not going to get you very far. But it might not anyway. Unless you're declaring war, which is different. So it's a displacement. I'm going to stand up and fight. I'm going to go and learn martial arts. And then, this thing that can be read as symptomatic of class struggle, symptomatic of it, gets transformed and existentialized. And now people do it to be all they can be. I don't do martial arts to fight. I do it to learn about myself. Yeah? Like meditating. Om. 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 Has anyone ever been to a yoga class? You're too young, you're too creaky in a bit. You just wait until you start to creak a bit. Oh god, yoga and Pilates and some yoga and Lartes. I might do something like that. Um, boxer size. <laughs> um, um, that was big in the 90s. Boxer size. Thai bog. Big, 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 big. Anyway. Which is, which, is, which is worse. I mean, that's a, that's a stage further than existentializing. So, you know, I'm going to go and do MMA. I'm going to do mixed martial arts, which is like smashing people to bits as much as you possibly can. But it's about myself, man. I don't, I'm not a violent person. It's about my inner demon. It's therapeutic. It's, you know, that kind of, it's about self-actualization, man. Um, so the martial arts become existentialized. They become commodities that you can buy, you know, for a, let's all go and do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Let's not fight. We don't need to fight. I don't need to fight. I know Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, and then it becomes less to Thai ball. Anyway, this is a different discussion. But you get, you get the point. You get this, the kind of sequence. Now, here we have something very important. You've heard this before? Name that tune. Oh. I think that's top of the box. Everybody wants to You know the song now, yes. You've got it, you've got it. Right. Much as I much as I don't want to, I'll, I'll stop it. But, um, now this is an interesting song, because this comes out in about 1975, and uh, we'll get to the, a lovely quotation from Bill Brown about this song. But an interesting little fact about this is that this song was never meant to be the single, they just recorded it, and, and then um, maybe that'll be on the B-side or whatever, but then that was released as a single, and it was massive, right? All over the world, all over, everywhere. It loved it. And it was actually the song that put disco as a musical genre on the map. Disco, there was no disco before this song. Right? And actually, and it, you know, the film that made disco as well was Saturday Night Fever, wasn't it? Which was 1977. And, and Bruce Lee features prominently in a poster in Saturday Night Fever. And, and that film is about working class. How do the working classes escape from their crap poor, impoverished, ghetto life. Bruce Lee, a Bruce Lee poster will feature in many kind of stories about how do we escape this dreary life? We do it through Kung Fu. So this is kind of, this is interesting because he's called Carl Douglas. Douglas. And he's from Trinidad, I think. And he cr culturally cross-dresses as, as Asian, sort of generically Asian. And it's also, it's about the kind of perception of, of, of Kung Fu, like, wow, it was a little, it was amazing, in fact, it was a little bit frightening. And then they said, here comes the big boss, <laughs> or whatever. And then it goes on. There's a lot to be said about the song, but, you know, it, it put disco out there. So actually, you could connect this song with, with kind of the more mainstreaming of, of gay culture, if you wanted. Because the connection between disco and drag and gay performance is really important. So we could put Bruce Lee if we wanted. Because he 
Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think Bruce Lee is a guy. I think we can short, short circuit what I'm trying to do here. But the, the, the kind of cultural networks, the popular cultural networks, that enable things to happen, it's quite interesting and quite complicated. But I think we could dot the dot in. I mean, you could just go, yeah, Bruce Lee, gay icon, oh, well, right there. Right? Okay. But we could go, ooh, disco. Let's go disco. Let's go. If you wanted. Um, so, ah, and here we come to almost, almost the end, I believe. Almost the end. Now, this is, there's a quotation here from, I know you can't read that, don't worry. Um, one of Stuart Hall's reiterated points, this is a quotation from Stuart Hall's essay, Notes on Deconstructing the Popular. One of Stuart Hall's reiterated points is that this year's radical symbol or slogan will be neutralised into next year's fashion that today's cultural breaks can be recuperated as a support to tomorrow's dominant system of values and meanings. And this is a point easily illustrated by the history of Kung Fu's success. Chuck Norris. Do you know Chuck Norris? Oh. <laughs> Chuck Norris. Right. Chuck Norris, who had demonstrated martial arts at several US military bases in the early 1960s and co-starred as the loser with Lee in 1973, soon managed to whiten martial art masculinity on the film. Bruce, uh, Chuck Norris, Steve Seagal, Jean Claude Van Damme, um, and that, what's that woman called again? Cynthia Rothrock. Whitened martial arts. Anyone can do it now. Um, anyone can anyone can be a, a master, and then but, but it, normally it changes a bit. So you see this also in, in, in Kill Bill Part Two. You see like you know the the classic story of the white westerner going to the east to learn the secrets of the the, the ancient mystical tradition, and then mastering it and coming back and being the best, the best of the best. That sort of orientalist as well. But with Chuck Norris type films, you get the militarization of martial arts. So you also get a new discourse about martial arts where you don't have to be taught by a. a, a, a a wise Chinese Buddhist or something, Shaolin monk, you can have been into special forces. Right? Ooh. The further commercialization and institutionalization of Kung Fu, marked by the proliferation of Kuns and regional Kung Fu federations, depended on attracting a more heterogeneous consumer group. To take a well known case in point, on the one hand, Jamaican born Carl yeah, Jamaica, okay, sorry. Jamaican born Carl Douglas, culturally cross dressing as the martial artist to promote his hit Kung Fu Fighting in nineteen seventy four, sustained the sign of interethnic countercultural challenge. On the other, the song mainstreamed and streamlined the aggression by reducing it to the rhythm of disco. Something aggressive, something violent, something scary in lots of different registers becomes a joke. I mean we all laugh, we hear it. Oh, oh. I can't believe you're going to play that in a lecture. Should be playing something serious. Like One Direction. I would only play One Direction to illustrate Lacanian theory. They have a brilliant take on the, the Lacanian kind of theory of the formation of desire. The object cause of desire, right? Have you, have you um, the, uh, I just can't see it. The, uh, you know that song? That's because she's beautiful. She don't know she's beautiful. <laughs> because she's, she's, she's beautiful, she don't know she's beautiful. I can't remember the age. I'd have to play it. I'd have to sing it. I'd have to sing it. And dance on it. Tell me what it's called. Um, <laughs> she, but the thing is, if you think about that, she's only attractive to him because she don't know she's beautiful. And if she did know she was beautiful, she wouldn't be beautiful. And you have this strange sort of paradoxical kind of, like the, the thing, the thing, the, the sort of, there's certain je ne sais quoi about her. That may, that, there's that something about her. This is different, isn't it? This is a digression. That makes her desirable. The object cause of desire is something that were she actually to under, he wants to tell her, he's serenading her, she's so beautiful. But if she actually, if, if, she's, if she's fit, but yeah, don't she know it kind of thing, then... <laughs> That's the streets, isn't it? That's a problem. I mean, it's a problem for the streets as well. She's fit, but she knows it. Does that mean she's not that fit? We don't want our women to behave in this way. We want them. But me? No. No. I'm not beautiful. Anyway, the, di 
The discretized tribute to the legacy of Bruce Lee, <coughs> as the music industry calls it, might be understood as working to discipline the notoriously raucous audience reaction to the films by syncopating the physical response to Lee's violence, just as it worked to homogenise martial art choreography into the mainstream codes of dance. If you ask anybody who was old enough to have gone to the cinema to see a Bruce Lee film, when they came out of the film, everyone was, doing, was being Bruce Lee, doing the kicks and the punches and <coughs> knocking the hell out of each other. Which is a very, very immediate and strong reaction to something, isn't it? So I think this may be, this may be the, last, the last bit. Charles Johnson's short story of the early 1980s helps to make legible the way US Kung Fu culture itself effectively expropriated and existentialized mass cultural inner city history from the early 1970s, a history in which the radical politics of the 1960s seem to resurface as radical consumption. This is the last bit. In the story I'm trying to tell about um, the story China tells and does not tell, post-nationality finally exists neither as the work of internationalists, Marxists, nor as the local instantiation of an inter-ethnic and international bond, but as a physical feat consumed as an image in the register of mass culture, so, you see how very complicated something very simple could be. So take away from that, do read it, the, the essay, see what you can get from it. But think about the way in which kind of the global circulation and movement of commodities can have not just sort of material, but also um, cultural, psychological, inter-ethnic, uh, impact and implications on society. So stacks, stacks and stacks going on there. But um, we leave it at that. I've given you all one of the module evaluation forms. Could you just, if you haven't done it, just bring it to the seminar? Actually, no, because some of you might not come to the seminar. If you've done it, hand it in. I've, I've memorised everyone who's here. I've got a photographic memory. I, once, I, know some, I knew someone who, who once said that he had a semi-photographic memory. And I was like, well, okay. Another way of putting that might be to say you're, you're a bit forgetful. You're a bit absent-minded. I can half remember some things really well. Um, yeah, I do need them back, so don't, don't, don't take them away from me. If you've done it, then just leave it there on that file. If you haven't done it yet, bring it to the seminar. Set up pretty deep. Okay? Thank you.